Good day, and welcome to our webinar on five ways to use cloud and IIoT to improve productivity, brought to you by CFE Media and Technology and sponsored by Emerson, Infor, Oracle NetSuite, and Epicor. Today's presentation can provide continuing education credits. CFE Media has met the standards and requirements of the Registered Continuing Education Program. Credit earned on completion of this program will be reported to RECEP at RECEP.net. Today we'll be joined by Alan Griffiths, a principal consultant for Kambashi, and by Mohamed Abwaili, founder and CEO of IOTCO. I'm Kevin Parker, a senior contributing editor with CFE Media. Thanks for tuning in to what's sure to be a very interesting program and discussion. Technology advance is only good if it makes you better. The technologies we'll be talking about today will include the Industrial Internet of Things, which makes use of at-the-process sensors, gateways, devices, actuators, and microcomputers connected by networks, wireless or otherwise, to computing systems. In addition, cloud computing enables on-demand network access to a shared pool of computer configurable computing resources, provisioned and released with minimal management. It sounds like these two things should work together to deliver productivity benefits. In fact, they do. A certificate of completion will be available for each participant to download upon successful completion of a test at the end of the webinar. As such, it does not include content that may be deemed or construed to be an approval or endorsement by RECEP. To take the Learning Unit exam, use the Learning Unit exam tab option at the top of your screen. The exam will open in a separate browser window. You can complete the exam after the webcast. However, the link will break when the webcast signs off. The exam will be posted on CFE Media websites with the on-demand version of this webcast. The exam is for one RECEP ASEC Certified Professional Development Hour. To get the best results from the webcast platform, please make note of the following as you participate in today's event. If you are having technical problems, click on the question mark at the top right-hand corner of the screen to bring up a list of system checks to make before escalating to an online technician. If you are experiencing issues with your slides or audio, please refresh your browser or click the Refresh Media button directly under the presenter's headshot. You can control the volume settings of this webcast by adjusting the volume of your computer or by adjusting the volume of the platform. If you do need a technician, Type a message into the Ask a Question box, and someone will get to you as quickly as possible. Answers to technical questions will be found in the Answered Questions box on the left-hand side of the screen. The Ask a Question box is also used to ask the speakers questions. You may ask questions at any time during the presentation. We'll get to as many as time allows. To download the presentation slides, use the Event Resources box on the left-hand side of the screen. You can download the presentation until the conclusion of the webcast. The link will break when the webcast signs off. This webcast is being recorded, including the Q&A session. We'll send you an email message within a week with a direct link to the webcast archive. We'll now hear from two of the sponsors of today's webinar. At the end of the video, you may experience a few seconds of silence to compensate for varied internet speeds. Stay tuned for today's presentation and discussion. Between all of our different product lines, we have close to a thousand items and, and several thousand kits. It was just too big to manage. We could not do it without the right technology partner, and it became NetSuite. Using NetSuite and having Suite Commerce allows us to manage multiple areas, multiple facets. It's connected to your ERP and to your website. To manage transactions, to search transactions, to really see what was going on in the business, you have just mass amounts of data at your fingertips.
Welcome back. Let's briefly review the topics that today's speakers will address. As a journalist, the challenges I most often hear of when it comes to IIoT are deciding where best to apply it and two, taking projects to scale. So the real mission is ensuring these technologies are applied productively, and that's what our speakers will be talking about. Production dashboards are not anything new. They can be downloaded off the internet or built using Microsoft Excel. What's different with IIoT and Edge is that new data types and new combinations of data can be promulgated inexpensively and while not burdening SCADA or other type control systems. For those on the call that are most concerned with data generated at the edge, that is, at the process itself, MQTT is an important standard. In the initial stage of its development, predictive maintenance seems to be the most prevalent application of IIoT technologies. In upstream and midstream oil and gas, the return on investment for automating functions at remote sites seems very clear. Applications are becoming increasingly sophisticated, extending from compressor farm management to chem chemical feed to artificial lift. IIoT is part of a larger movement whereby proprietary automation technologies are being replaced by information technologies originally developed for consumer and commercial markets. Cloud has revitalized a number of engineering, operations, and enterprise software markets, simplifying use of applications and moving from a licensing to a subscription model. It is possible to integrate data from edge gateways directly into transactional systems for maintenance or other resources planning functions. Servitization provides new revenue streams and allows economies of scale at a time when highly trained personnel are hard to come by. Equipment providers, however, can struggle as to how to comprehensively or rapidly incorporate the requisite technologies into their products because it raises costs. They fear being undersold by suppliers when customers are too strictly focused on initial CapEx costs and not looking at what a system may cost over time. Scientists today don't have theories. Instead, they build models. It's the same with engineers. Using IIoT, engineers can forge direct links between a process and the models they use to develop, test, and perform simulations in production environments. I'd now like to introduce our first speaker, Mohammed Abwali. Mohammed Abwali is founder and CEO of IOTCO, a provider of industrial internet of things, software, and services. Mohammed brings 20 years of manufacturing technology experience in digital transformation and predictive maintenance and analytics, with in-depth knowledge of delivering productivity improvements in the automotive, aerospace, and defense, medical devices, and oil and gas industries. Prior to forming IOTCO, Mohammed led and grew four CAMS operations in the area, in the Americas. He began his career working for IBM, followed by a stint with the National Science Foundation Center for Intelligent Maintenance Systems at the University of Cincinnati. Mohammed holds a PhD in industrial engineering specializing in predictive maintenance from the University of Cincinnati and a bachelor's in systems engineering from the University of Arizona. Mohammed, please forgive me for messing up your name a little bit at the, uh, at the beginning, but welcome to today's webinar and please go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, this is Mohammed. And uh, thank you, everybody, for the opportunity to uh, give this short presentation here uh, as part of the CFE webinar. Uh, so uh, as Kevin mentioned, I've been in the field for about 20 years, and half of my life I spent in manufacturing, and uh, the other half of my career I spent uh, in the software space serving manufacturing. Uh, I'd like to give a, a presentation today, a short presentation on you know, how manufacturers specifically today are leveraging the cloud and utilizing the industrial internet of things and predictive analytics to you know, scale productivity across their operations, you know, increasing uptime, reducing scraps and quality on the plant floor, 
and uh, achieving a significant business impact. So my presentation today is really threefold. You know, first and foremost, I'd like to, you know, define uh, several, you know, acronyms and jargon and, and, and things that have been uh, words that are being used here and there. You know, primarily, you know, what is digital transformation? What is Industry 4.0? What is IoT? What is the Industrial Internet of Things or IIoT? So I'd like uh, to start with some clarification on what is happening in the industry today. Um, I'd like to follow that with a discussion on, you know, technologies that are being used in manufacturing today and specific use cases or case studies on how IoT and predictive technology is being applied in smart factories and smart products. And I'll explain both. Um, and then I'd like to conclude with a call to action. So the fourth industrial revolution is upon us. And so uh, many of you on the call may have heard about Industry 4.0. I'd like to kind of define uh, several phases that the industry has gone through over the past years that has led to today's fourth industrial revolution. So obviously first came the first industrial revolution, you know, with mechanization, with power, with water, with steam. This was followed by the second industrial revolution where assembly lines, you know, came to be mass production, um, electricity was, was utilized. Then obviously came the third industrial revolution with the advent of, you know, the CPU, the computing powers, the automation, the PLC, programmable logic circuits, and so on and so forth. And then today, the fourth industrial revolution. So, so in fact, this is a trend of automation and data exchange that is happening in manufacturing today. Okay. Some refer to the fourth industrial revolution as even smart factory. In different parts of the world, for example, in the USA, some refer to it as manufacturing 4.0. You know, some have referred to it as digital manufacturing. So, so the idea is here how to create so-called cyber physical systems. Okay. Just imagine a machine on a plant floor that's a physical piece of asset and imagine modeling that machine and the behavior of that machine in the cyber world, which is the IT world. So how can those cyber physical systems communicate and cooperate with each other and communicate and cooperate with humans in real time across the value chain of manufacturing? And of course, this doesn't just apply to manufacturing. However, you know, part of the focus of today's presentation uh, will be in the manufacturing world. So the fourth industrial revolution creates the digital connected world using the internet, using the cloud, and therefore driving connectivity and driving value to the business that folks have not been able to achieve before in, in the prior uh, revolutions. So let me, let me then define, uh, even on a higher level, what is IoT? Um, you know, the funny thing is IoT has been around us for many years. This is not a new topic, although it might be a new name behind the topic. You know, when I, when I leave my home in the morning and I start driving, I have a Nest thermostat at home. A lot of you may have that thermostat. And it actually connects to the Internet. It connects to the cloud. And it senses that I have left my home and started driving away and it automatically starts reducing the temperature in my house in order to save me my energy bill. This is a beautiful example of an IoT device which is connected in a smart home. So the idea of IoT is all industries, whether it's my home in a residential setting, whether it is a jet engine flying in the sky which cruises and lands and sends snapshots of data, so that before the jet engine, you know, arrives in Chicago from London, you know, there is a spare part ready to fix that jet engine before the plane even lands on, on the tarmac. So IoT is about connectivity and it is about delivering further value from data being collected from, you know, assets and devices around the world. So IoT has... In specifically in manufacturing, IoT has been used heavily in safety critical environments, which, which necess necessitate connectivity and necessitate collecting data and analyzing data. For, for example, 
you know, nuclear, in the nuclear power industry or in the uh, mining industry or in the aircraft industry due to the safety critical components and, and, you know, people's lives that need to be monitored. So now taking the message from IoT in other fields and applying it in the manufacturing floor, here comes the Industrial Internet of Things or IIoT. And if you look at a manufacturing floor, there are several layers in any manufacturing plant. But unfortunately, a lot of those layers are typically isolated. They are, they are running in silos. They may not be connected to each other. You have the machine layer. You have the CNCs and the PLCs making parts. You have the process data historians. You have, in some cases, manufacturing execution systems that are tying the plant floor to the ERP layer. And at the end of the day, those vital systems intertwine and work together and the industrial IoT connects those isolated systems together to deliver value for the customer that has, has never been fulfilled before. And therefore comes, I would say, trends, smart factory trends, and even uh, government-led things like Industry 4.0, which was actually initially led you know, by the German government, then became an EU initiative, then became a global initiative across the world. So what is the central message here of IoT, IIoT, and the initiatives behind it, like Industry 4.0, really boils down to four things, which we will briefly touch upon in today's presentation. And, you know, in Kevin's introductory slide, he already started, you know, touching on some of these. One is the technology behind it, okay? You know, there are MES systems, there are ERP systems, there are predictive analytics tools that are using artificial intelligence that are being introduced today. So there are technologies that are able to start marrying data that are coming from, from, from different parts of the manufacturing operation. Then you have the analytics, the analytics that are able to use AI and machine learning and advanced mathematics in order to convert big data into smart data that can be utilized to deliver value to the business. And then you have connectivity, which is in many cases a challenge because on a typical plant floor, we are not just dealing with brand new assets, we are dealing with machines with a range of types and ages and processes. You have machines from 2019, you have machines from the 1950s or 60s that are still running making parts. And the idea here is how do we connect to the assets to bring relevant data from PLCs or sensors into the analytics technologies out there today to deliver value to the business. And there comes the value to the business, the ROI, the return on investment. How do we use advanced analytics today to improve uptime significantly in the manufacturing operation? How do we re reduce scraps and quality issues significantly? And how to sustain the uptime gains and sustain the scrap reductions over time? So I hope this paints the picture around what is happening in the industry today. And in order to track track what is happening, there obviously needs real-time metrics to be delivered on a plant floor. And today, all manufacturers measure productivity. Everybody measures how many pieces they produce, how many good, how many scraps. You know, underneath the iceberg, as some say it, is a, is a hidden factory. And the goal of using technology, analytics, and connectivity is to really, you know, unleash the hidden factory that a lot of folks are not looking at today, which immediately impact the P&L and the bottom line productivity of a manufacturing plant. And therefore, many, many manufacturers today are measuring, whether they're doing that manually or automatically, they are measuring metrics like overall equipment effectiveness, OEE. This is a key metric in the manufacturing environment today. This simply measures what is your utilization, what is the true uptime of running your assets in your manufacturing plant. What is performance? What is the true speed of your operation? Are you making parts, you know, in a manufacturing automotive operation that can be very fast cycle times? Are you making parts every 10 seconds per machine or per, per wheel coming off the line, or are you making it in 9 seconds or 11 seconds? So how to improve the performance and the speed of the operations? And what is the quality? And it's not just about scraps and reworks. It is also what is the reason for quality issues? And what are the quality characteristics and the statistical process control and capability around it to ensure the highest level of quality? But these metrics are great to tell the manufacturer what is happening now and what is happening historically. But 
how about metrics that also give an insight in what could happen to the future? So thereby comes predictive analytics and offering newer insights and newer metrics, offering insights like the health of your asset or the health of your operation. Just like everybody goes to the doctor, measuring your blood pressure, your vitals, your annual checkup, your doctor is able to tell you, are you healthy or are you unhealthy? The same can be done with a machine, with a line, with an asset, with a manufacturing operation. By collecting data like vibration, temperature, humidity, current, voltage, all that big data is able to flow to advanced analytic engines that are able to inform the manufacturer you know, deeper insights into why is my OEE less than 85%, for example. Am I having health issues on my machine? And not only that, but what is the remaining useful life of this asset? As in, what is a prediction of how many days or how many cycles until the spindle bearing on my machine tool is going to fail, for example? And this has to be done with, with an extremely high level of prediction accuracy in order to assure that spare parts are available to fix the machine before it actually fails, for example. Lastly is diagnostics. So now that I know if an asset is healthy and when the asset might fail with a high level of prediction accuracy, what is the diagnosis of failure? Why will the asset fail? What is the true root cause of the failure? Is it the, you know, second axis or second joint on my robotic that is going to fail? In a typical preventive maintenance cycle today, which is a fail and fix approach, a maintenance uh, personnel would go in and typically change all the bearings on an asset, for example, in the case of a robotic. But imagine an analytic solution that is able to pinpoint to the manufacturer when the asset is unhealthy before it fails and how many days or cycles are left to the failure as well as the diagnostic of the failure as in the specific area to fix on the machine. So this is the future. These are new metrics that are enabling manufacturers to drive newer value to their business. So what is the business case? If you're running a factory today, improving OEE is key, improving uptime, reducing quality. So predictive maintenance becomes crucial. Predictive maintenance as in moving away from a fail and fix approach or a corrective maintenance approach into a predict and prevent approach so you can run and sustain your OEE numbers at a very high number. Second is optimizing spare part management. There's a there's a significant cost of maintenance spent today on keeping spare parts and awaiting machines to fix until or to fail until they, they are fixed. So if I'm able to know when the machine will truly fail before it fails, you could actually integrate that with your spare part system or your maintenance system and significantly reduce the spare part on hand because you can actually order a new spare part to be shipped from the supplier to your machine so you can fix it before the machine actually fails. So predictive maintenance could immediately start optimizing not only the PM schedule but the spare part management and schedule behind uh, the, the maintenance activity. Then comes predictive quality. We have manufacturers today that are actually predicting defects on their machine or on their line before the part actually ships out of the line or ships out of the, out of the process. Just imagine a, a manufacturer that makes aluminum casting and at the end of the aluminum casting line, you have x-ray machines that are taking a picture or a vision camera that takes a picture of the part for quality purposes. Today, you can use artificial intelligence to create a digital twin of that part so not only can you predict the behavior or the health of the machine, but you can actually predict that a specific wheel or part number coming off the line is going to be a bad part. So predictive quality is a new domain of understanding and analytics that allows you to significantly reduce scraps by using analytics on the plant floor. And obviously process optimization. If a manufacturer is able to monitor and predict the behavior of machines on the plant floor and the quality of, of the parts being produced. You could in some situations start feeding data back to the line, feeding data back to the process, even redesigning the process to allow that process to continue operating in the best or optimal manner. And this is process optimization. 
But by the way, analytics are not only applied in factories. And I want to touch upon smart products. And I want to show two examples briefly. One is on smart factory and one is on smart product. But we have manufacturers today that make pumps, for example, and they sensorize the pumps. And when the pumps ship out of the operation, those pumps are IoT enabled. They are connected to the cloud, they are leveraging the cloud, and they're leveraging the analytics that are sitting on the cloud so that the manufacturer can monetize the analytics. They can actually offer this product in a subscription form to their end user so that they can remotely monitor the product and offer diagnostic services. And a great example is machine tool makers. When, when you ship a machine today as part of the warranty, you can actually offer analytics as a service or predictive analytics as a service so that before you know, your machine requires a new spindle, you actually have uh, your supplier calling you, machine OEM calling you, telling you, hey, based on the analytics service we're monitoring, your machine needs a new spindle you know, in the next five days. So it becomes uh, strategic to your operation to ensure this machine is always running and uh, basically making parts. Closed loop design. How can I take data from the field that is being used today or collected today from the product and feed it back to the design process so I can improve, improve future generations of this product? Okay. This is also a great use of analytics today. Uh, we call it closed loop life cycle management because data can be collected from the field and, and there's a lot of historical data out there and that historical data is fed back to the design process in order to create better pumps or better motors uh, that are then shipped as future versions to the customer. So looking at two examples, one example is a smart factory and it all starts with the business case. This is an example actually of a, of a robotic factory. It's an automotive OEM factory with 500 robotics. Just imagine the cost of one minute of downtime in that factory is about $10,000, significant. There's typically 30 robot failures that occur in every year, and each robot failure is around 30 minutes. And just showing you that this equates to almost $300,000 annual cost of a single robot failure in an OEM plant. And those numbers may actually uh, be less than you know, the current uh, numbers out there in the field. Those are real numbers from an OEM. This was about a few years ago. So if a predictive analytics solution can only predict half of the robot failures, half, meaning 15, there is a potential saving of about $4.5 million per year per factory. And those are true numbers from an automotive OEM today that has you know, utilized predictive analytics in, in a correct way in their operation. But, but just imagine there isn't that many robot failures that happen out there, but when a robot failure does happen, and it does happen, at a low frequency, but the impact is extremely high at about $10,000 per minute. So that's a $4.5 million saving. And this is what could be realized. That robotic OEM today, or that automotive OEM, is able to actually visualize the health of the asset in real time. They are able to predict the future health of their asset with a 95% confidence interval they are able to understand when this asset is going to fail before it actually fails. In this case, the asset is a robotic, and the manufacturer is actually able to pinpoint the specific axis or specific joint on the robotic that is going to fail. So using predictive analytics in an intuitive way for visualizing health, predicting health, and diagnosing health on industrial equipment and industrial assets you know, has become a reality and is being utilized intensely today in manufacturing with varying levels of success, okay, depending on, of course, the business case and, and the maturity uh, of the deployments. Here's an example for a smart product. Uh, Komatsu is a, is a mining operation, for example, where we've worked with in the past, uh, but there is many examples of, of, you know, large truck manufacturers like this. So, if, if I'm an owner of a mining operation or a mining site, you know, I'm working with large tractors like this all over the world. And just imagine to service a, a large tractor like this, 
that is, say, sitting in the middle of the Canadian desert or, or, or the Australian desert, it is very costly to send maintenance personnel there to fix the machine. And if the tractor or the machine fails, the, there's a significant downtime cost because this tractor is not making you money anymore. It is not mining and it is not doing what it's supposed to do. So utilizing predictive analytics for a expensive piece of capital like this and the ability to be able to send a spare part to this asset before the spare part actually fails is crucial. And the use of cloud or and communication here is also crucial because for the location of that asset out in the desert, it is very difficult to you know, collect big data, vibration data, let's say from the engine, and to send that out in real time. It is very expensive. The communication protocols are not there. So there comes the idea and the use of edge analytics, where there is artificial intelligence that is actually embedded in the tractor. And this artificial intelligence is able to convert that big data into metadata like health and features and diagnostics and, met and send that metadata to the cloud using satellite communication or whatever available communication there is. So you can order spare parts in real time and ship them uh, to be fixed to the operation. And again, visualizing it and looking at that information is crucial and integrating it with the spare part is also crucial to ensure near zero downtime uh, for that asset in the field. So the technology behind all this, there's several predictive analytics solution out there, but I think this is a, a good summary of what clients are looking for today and the type of use cases that are available in the field of predictive analytics. I mean, at the end of the day, the business case is, how do I achieve a worry-free process? A worry-free process in manufacturing is zero downtime and zero defects or at least near zero downtime and near zero defects. So there comes predictive maintenance, looking at the asset health and making predictions and diagnostics. And there comes predictive quality, looking at the part health and predicting defects on lines and assets before they actually happen. And such predictive analytic solutions are able to capture data from different parts of the environment. They're able to capture asset data directly from the machine or maybe requiring add-on sensors. They're able to look at the stability of the process itself by capturing data from SCADA systems and historians and even MES systems. They're even able to incorporate worker data and the skill set of the workers that are fixing the machine. And most importantly, with the quality inspection equipment out there, the CMM machines, the X-ray machines, thermography, and so on and so forth, uh, vision cameras that have become an integral part of some manufacturing operations, product quality becomes an integral input into the predictive solution because improving uptime is great, but everybody wants to reduce scrap and everybody wants to ensure a zero defect environment. And therefore, predictive quality has become a significant uh, use case for predictive analytics in manufacturing today. And I think an, an, an important message here is a lot of manufacturers are not willing to spend time and effort in trial and error approaches. Um, you know, folks should not embrace predictive analytics as a data science project. Uh, predictive analytics has started to become a template-based approach, okay? Manufacturers today are looking for proven solutions that can be deployed very quickly in the manufacturing environment. The time to deploy should be rapid. The learning curve should be rapid. And the cost should be significantly effective for their operation. So the idea of solution templates for manufacturing where an industrial robotic or a machine tool or a stamping piece of equipment or ancillary equipment like pumps, motors, gearboxes, and so on and so forth, those templates enable manufacturers to very quickly deliver predictive maintenance and predictive quality for their operation. So just imagine for an industrial robotic, the ability to get data like the motor torque, the torque current, or the temperature of each one of the joints or axis 
and using artificial intelligence to convert that into the health of the motor bearing and being able to predict with a very high accuracy that this motor bearing on you know, joint number one is going to fail in the next five days. You know, such solution templates and point solutions are critical for manufacturing today versus a toolbox approach where a large team of data scientists with high level of skill set would be needed to actually build something new from scratch. So there has been a movement lately to move away from this creation and trial and error and R&D phase into a practical phase of actually deploying data science and AI fairly quickly in a manufacturing or in a smart factory uh, or in a smart product operation. Then you have machine tools. Machine tools have critical components and we call, we call it a smart machine. In a smart machine, you have a spindle bearing where you can get vibration data that can be very quickly used for predictive analytics. You have the ball screw or the feed axis where you can in actually in a non-intrusive way without sensors, you can obtain CNC data like uh, the torque or the current or the voltage or the position of the ball screw. And you can actually use analytics to predict the health and detect early faults with the ball screw in terms of lubrication and starvation and so on and so forth. So many, many, many templates out there that now enable manufacturers to quickly try and embrace predictive solutions and, and add quick value to the operations. And within each template, there is a systematic process. And there's a six-step systematic process that predictive analytics systems typically go through today. First off, of course, starting with the data collection that is required, whether it comes from the machine or add-on sensors and moving into the artificial intelligence and machine learning process that allow that data to be converted in, into cleaner signals that, are, that can then be input into the feature engineering side of the data science where you extract statistics, you select the features, and you reduce the feature set and use that feature set to train your health models, whether it's unsupervised or, unsuper or supervised learning, so that if I'm a maintenance personnel, I can intuitively see the health of my machine. And then based on this, I can offer predictions, short-term, long-term predictions, and in the future diagnose the root cause of failure of the asset. And therefore, AI and machine learning becomes a recipe, an analytics recipe that is embedded in all these steps here, again, delivering predictive maintenance, predictive quality value to the, to the customer base. Lastly, on cloud. Cloud is crucial for IoT implementations, especially for smart products. This is a typical implementation, in fact, for any IoT system. You have your machine layer with your controllers and the add-on sensors that may be added to the devices, such as vibration. You have your sensor layer and selection, which is crucial. You know, we putting a, a one kilohertz vibration sensor on a spindle versus putting a 20 kilohertz vibration sensor on a spindle would, would immensely impact the value of the analytics. And I'm sure some of the audience members on the call understand what I'm saying. The sampling frequency of that sensor and the selection of the right sensor is crucial to the application. And then bringing that analog data, converting it into digital data that is then aggregated on, say, industrial PCs or data loggers. And this is where edge computing can occur where these data loggers can actually, you know, do the signal processing and the feature extraction, sending the metadata out to the cloud, you know, be it Amazon, Google, Microsoft, or whatnot. And this becomes the visualization and user experience layer that the customer uh, or the client will be able to access. So, so the cloud is crucial. The cybersecurity and the security of the data transmission across all these layers is crucial as well. And therefore, being able to have a template-based approach that is able to you know, complement uh, the cloud strategy of the implementation here is also very important for the success and scalability of, of the pilots and the projects. So long story short, start your digital transformation journey today. Think big, start small, but act now. And education is crucial. Education and strategy around what is the best approach to tackle digital transformation today for your specific application. 
think about a proof of value. A proof of value is a pilot. And a pilot is very important to start. And the pilot should be scalable. But these are not concepts any longer. These are proof of values that bring in technology and enables you to convert the technology uh, into a business case. So marry the technology with the business case and deliver a proof of value for your business. Whether you are running a smart factory and whether you're looking for improving uptime or whether you are making products that you're sensorizing and tapping into the analytics, think about the business case. Within your smart factory, you're improving uptime, you're reducing quality, you're optimizing spare part and still using the analytics. Within the smart products, you're actually creating new lines of revenue. You're servitizing and monetizing the analytics and delivering further value to your clients. The audience may yet be different, but the value is the value equation is also crucial. And, and with this, um, I'd like to end my presentation and hand it back to Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Well, thanks, Mohammed, for a very insightful presentation. Uh, I want to urge our audience to send us your questions now. I can see we're going to be a little pressed for time here, but we will follow up with answers to any questions that we don't get to uh, after the um, webinar is over. Uh, first, I'd like now to turn to our second speaker, Alan Griffiths. Alan Griffiths is Principal Consultant for Kambashi. His focus is on understanding how engineering and manufacturing organizations use technical software applications to meet business needs. Alan has held development, marketing, and management positions with both user and vendor organizations. Prior to joining Kambashi, Alan spent 10 years with the leading global computer-aided design and product lifecycle management company, analyzing the needs of customers and helping to define product solutions and develop markets. He has an engineering degree from Cambridge University and is qualified as a chartered engineer and Prince2 project manager. Alan, welcome to today's webinar, and please go ahead. Thank you, Kevin, and thanks, Mo, for an excellent uh, presentation, quite a deep dive into some of the fundamentals of IoT. Um, Kambashi as a company uh, focuses on analyzing the market, so we'll be talking at a slightly higher level in terms of uh, the market trends uh, and the companies involved in the market and how it's evolving. So it should work uh, nicely together. So this is the agenda I'd like to run through. Um, first of all, why is IoT important and why now, particularly in the manufacturing area that we're talking about today? A little on standards and industrial IoT and the what's important about them, uh, how some of the leading providers are addressing the market, some new trends again, and some new relationships that they're developing, uh, a comment on maturity of the uh, way uh, IoT can be applied, and then some conclusions. I won't dwell too long on how what IoT is. I think Mo covered that very well. Um, an example I, I like, uh, which it encompasses all the elements of IoT, uh, quite a sophisticated one, is the uh, the Tesla motor car, which has uh, an onboard computer, um, which um, is able to uh, take data from all of the uh, devices uh, in the uh, car, which is like um, l lidars, radars, and as um, uh, Mo showed in his example, there's a concentrator, it acts as a concentrator. Uh, and then that goes up through the cloud, usually offline, to the central computer. And because Tesla has been running trials for years, they've got masses of data, which they analyze centrally. And this is used to improve the algorithms uh, which control the car. Of course, the cars are not allowed to drive in fully autonomous mode at the moment, but that's mainly a regulatory and experiential issue. Um, they can drive semi-autonomously at the moment, and they will get more and more autonomous as life goes on. Uh, the algorithms uh, are developed using deep learning in the center, and they're downloaded to each car regularly. Uh, similarly, uh, and this is more common 
uh, feature in today's cars. Uh, simply by connecting the vehicles, you can download uh, software upgrades, which is which is uh, valuable, uh, and the service requests and, and things like that. Another one, uh, which again Mo touched on, is uh, predictive maintenance, and uh, Mazak is a good example of this. They they've worked with uh, Cisco to to supply predictive maintenance capability uh, for machine tooling operations, um, which gives higher machine uptime, improved analytics, et cetera, which was covered earlier. Um, and this is another good example. So what's new about this area? Why now? Um, well, it's uh, the affordability of sensors. Uh, as you know, uh, and as Mo said, this uh, connected Factories uh, and connected uh, instruments of various kinds have been around for 20 or 30 years, uh, but the sensors have become much more affordable. Um, the um, cloud storage and computing has become more easily available and cost effective to get started with. And we have, of course, big data and uh, AI, which is, can be applied uh, effectively uh, into these uh, areas. So let, just say a little bit about um, standards and the IoT. Um, there are frameworks come from various areas, uh, obviously in process and discrete manufacturing operational technology industrial automation companies have done a lot of work at factory level field area networks you might call them uh, the wide area networks have tended to be developed by some of the more IT oriented companies like Microsoft IBM and Cisco and people like that um, and then we have the mobile communications technology which develops a tremendous number of standards. Um, for example, uh, with um, manufacturing, uh, you may have heard in the context of smart factories, OPC UA, which is uh, used uh, by the uh, in lots of industry 4.0 applications, and something called DDS, which is a data-focused uh, communications. Uh, uh, standard from the OMG. Um, in the mobile telecommunications area, uh, there are a, a number of standards which are developing, uh, which I'll sh say something about uh, in the next slide. So uh, I was at the Hanover show in L uh, Germany a few weeks ago, and there were a few announcements there. One was on Industry 4.0 which was the Open Industry 4.0 uh, standard. It, it's not really a standard, it's more of a collaboration to promote open uh, in, and interoperable solutions. And a number of initially German companies have come together to try and make this easier to get started with. And, and that's the, the key thing today. Um, Microsoft uh, announced a, a big um, collaboration with um, BMW to um, promote uh, open manufacturing platform, uh, which is initially it is Azure based, so it's not that open, um, but it's uh, intended to allow lots of partners to come in and use the technology. And uh, <clears throat> the um, uh, in 5G, the communications. There's a lot happening in that area, which will, it's more of an enabler for IoT than an, an actual um, uh, fundamental technology. Uh, but it, it does, it is developing use cases for enhanced uh, broadband, um, uh, ultra reliable, low latency communications, a bit of a mouthful. But this um, uh, is very useful in remote surgery, autonomous vehicles, etc. And then massive machine type communications, uh, MMTC, which is uh, uh, intended for Internet of Things type applications where you have a very large number of devices in a small area. 
which may only send data sporadically. So these are enabling technologies which will make the uh, practical IoT more prevalent in the future. Some of the challenges uh, to the standards development are, number one is semantics. Now this, what this means is it's all very well at being able to connect two devices together or, or to take data and read it from a device in the field or in the factory. But you have to know exactly what that means, the meaning of that data. And uh, so there are quite a lot of uh, frameworks and, and uh, industry specific use cases and test beds being developed so that they can apply them into particular interest uh, industries. But this is like the templates which uh, Mo referred to. And I agree that is very, very much an area where things are evolving now. Security is always an issue um, where multiple devices, systems and organizations need to communicate. Um, and of course, um, the, the key one is acceptance. Um, and, and there are kind of competing standards at the moment, but organizations such as the IIC, uh, which is an American centric uh, body, uh, is trying to pull together some of these standards to make the acceptance wider. So, what we, we have, as a company, uh, need to understand the technology and the trends, and we need to do this in order to be able to measure the market and, and who's doing what and, and to see what's happening. And uh, what we've seen um, recently, well, we've been looking at this for five years or more, but in the last year or two, um, taking on the theme of templates and uh, use cases, We've seen the um, market developing in lots of different areas with different companies, but all the common theme being connected. So we have connected uh, buildings, connected production, transportation, asset, product, production, uh, city, etc. And uh, we are analyzing the market in these sectors and looking at the uh, main players and developing a total available market size uh, and uh, a ranking of who the main players are. Um, the next slide shows um, some of the um, re interim research we've done by looking at uh, use cases and how many uh, templates, if you like, or connected applications uh, companies have developed. And these numbers themselves give an indication of how much, just by looking at 20 of the major providers, of how much uh, uh, how much work has been going on in the different areas, which ones are the hottest, if you like, which is quite interesting. We were now we're now building up revenue figures based on this to get a market size and relative growth. And this is the kind of information we'll be building up. This is just test data at the moment, but we will be uh, delivering this uh, as a uh, as a market <coughs> excuse me a market data set in June so um what we've seen and this was very evident at the Hanover show uh, is the difference in where the main players are coming from uh, we have uh, enterprise systems industrial automation providers and pure technology providers, if you like. These are three you know, areas which we see a lot of activity in. <clears throat> and what we see is that because they have different uh, standards, different capabilities, and different sets of customers, and they tend to talk at different levels, we see a lot of um, partnerships developing between uh, companies from these different sectors. The industrial automation companies, although they may be very large companies um, like Rockwell, Schneider, and companies like that, they tend to talk um, at implement their solutions at factory level, um, whereas the, uh, industri the the enterprise systems clearly uh, work at enterprise level, uh, and the technology uh, companies tend to um, provide technology, like uh, we measured, uh, counted over 350 IoT platforms. Uh, so you can buy the technology and do it yourself, 
but uh, we see a trend towards package solutions uh, as being where where it's at at the moment, um, where where most of the uh, activity is coming from. So to look at some examples of where companies are working together. Um, if we look at, uh, you may have heard of PTC. They have uh, a product called ThingWorks, um, which is uh, an Internet of Things enabling technology. But they also apply it in solutions. Uh, they, they, PTC tends to work at uh, uh, enterprise level. They've developed a, a very strong partnership with, with Rockwell, <coughs> who work at the industrial automation and have a lot of implementations at factory level. I'm sure you're familiar with them, from PLCs right up to whole industrial automation solutions. And Rockwell has, in fact, invested a billion dollars in the company PTC to strengthen and support and develop this relationship. Um, you also see um, both Rockwell and PTC have strong relationships with Microsoft, who provide cloud uh, technology through Azure and also Azure IoT and analytics capability. And um, they uh, work with it, Microsoft works with Intel. So there's a, a quite a complex array of companies working together to provide these sophisticated solutions. And I mentioned BMW as an example where Microsoft is working closely to provide a platform, this OMP platform. Um, they're also working uh, on the Siemens Gamesa, which is a wind farm in Spain, but it's it developed in Spain, but implemented worldwide. And a company called RTI, which specializes in the um, edge uh, concentration and uh, real-time communications, is working on that project too. So we, we see these quite strong relationships developing to try and deliver package solutions into the market. Another example is uh, Siemens, whose PLM division uh, is working closely with its industrial automation division, again, to give the, if you call it, uh, uh, IT at the top at enterprise level, working with the factory level automation. It's a powerful combination. and. Uh, they're using Amazon Web Services and working closely with Amazon, in fact, on a very large project with Volkswagen, which is a worldwide project, which is a very significant project, which is going on there. So, if we come on to the next slide, um, there's a lot of these relationships are happening. Dasso announced a relationship with ABB. Um, where they're uh, working again on the enterprise level down at, and then the factory level. Uh, and an example of another car company, which Dasso is very strong with, is JLR here in the UK. Um, SAP has a strong relationship with Honeywell and Oracle, again, an IT enterprise company. Uh, amongst others, has a strong relationship with Mitsubishi down at the factory automation level. So we see a lot happening in that area. And of course, uh, at the large level, when companies are talking about digital transformation, uh, we there's a lot of uh, involvement and a lot of impact from companies like the big management consultants and system integrators. Um, and as well as the ones listed here that you probably know of, there's also um, uh, companies like IBM have their own global services. HPE has Pointnext, which is its own uh, uh, services company. And there are many others at a smaller level involved in delivering these solutions. So just to finish, well, not, not the last section, uh, let's talk a bit about maturity, because you see lots of different types of solutions. and it's useful to have an idea of what you're trying to accomplish and uh, where you're going before you head in into it. And it was, we've, we're working with a lot of industry players uh, in this research, and we are seeing, uh, they're, or they're telling us, um, in their implementations, there's a level of technical maturity from monitor, simple monitoring solutions 
which could be uh, simply measuring temperature or control uh, in a in the alarm, uh, setting off an alarm. Uh, control and optimization when you're actually uh, sensing and controlling uh, in some level right up to autonom autonomy and it may not be fully autonomous but as in the tesla example partially autonomous or it may be a machine in a factory or a production line which uh, is partly autonomous in terms of reacting to changes in uh, temperature or humidity etc but there's also a level of business maturity or business impact if you like so a quite a simple monitoring uh, solution could have a massive business impact uh, as in some of the and then when you put, add anal analytics to that and you get into uh, predictive maintenance it, it can be a, a very impactful business solution um, so the, the level whether it's just improving efficiency or developing new net revenue streams or really disruptive it's another axis really on the um, on the level of uh, the maturity, if you like, of the solution. So Tesla, uh, the example, if it was, was fully autonomous, could be considered a, a disruptive business uh, model, uh, but also uh, auto moving towards the autonomous uh, level in terms of technical maturity. So it would be in the uh, top right corner, as it were. So just to conclude, um, Digitalization has long been an objective uh, for companies. There's been a lot of talk about that for many years. Uh, I've been in this uh, industry in manufacturing for uh, over 25 years, and they've always been talking about it and doing it to a large extent. And these cheaper, powerful sensors and cloud computing are making it affordable. Um, IoT you know, can be and is included in most strategies. Um, and I think the, the biggest trend we're seeing at the moment is in packaged applications, which make it easy. Uh, they're targeted towards uh, your industry and the level that you want to implement them without having to do a massive uh, organizational change. And we think a lot's going to happen in that area, as well as some of the more sophisticated projects. We, we see a lot of... Uh, uh, work and uh, spend coming in that area. Um, I think that's my final slide, so I'll uh, like to pass you back to Kevin now and thank you all for your attention. Well, thanks, Alan. I'm afraid we might, might have rushed you a little bit there at the end as we're pressed for time. But let's hear from our two additional sponsors of today's webinar and then we'll wrap things up. Epicor Software Corporation provides industry-specific business software designed around the needs of manufacturing, distribution, retail, and services organizations. More than 40 years of experience with their customers' unique business processes and operational requirements is built into every solution, in the cloud, hosted, or on-premises. Today, over 20,000 customers in 150 countries around the world rely on their expertise and solutions to improve performance and profitability. Epicor is driving growth for companies globally with solutions including Epicor Enterprise Resource Planning, Human Capital Management, Financial Management, Manufacturing Execution Systems, Supply Chain Management, Retail Software, Distribution Software, Lumber and Build Materials Software, and Automotive Aftermarket Software. Epicor products are working today on a global scale, delivering impressive benefits to companies just like yours. For more information, please visit epicor.com. Today, with IIoT and digital transformation, we can extend operational performance improvements beyond core process control to improve reliability, safety, and energy. However, there hasn't been a platform that can integrate, analyze, and distribute data from various instruments, assets, systems, and personnel to provide a holistic view of operational systems and assets. Like DCS does for the core process, it hasn't existed until now. Emerson's Plant Web Optics is an asset performance platform that consolidates asset health from multiple technologies to a central digital framework where you can 
Personalize content in relevant context to enable proactive action and real-time collaboration. Connect with your CMMS system to automate work orders. Validate operational response with closed loop reporting. Plant web optics, making a digital transformation for better asset performance. I'm afraid we're out of time for today, uh, but we're going to answer, give your questions to our presenters and we'll post the answers on our website in the next several days. Uh, thank you for, to our expert panelists and thank you all for attending today's webcast. We hope it suited your purposes. For more information, go to the website link noted in the interface. I'd like to thank our sponsors for today's webcast and now that we're just about done, we'd like to know how we did. The exit survey will pop up on your screen as soon as this webcast ends. Please take a moment to complete it as we use this information to improve our webcast. On behalf of CFE Media, we'll see you next time.